It's 9.36 on the evening of the 11th of January 2015. I've got a little bit of recapping to do. The trouble is I, um, I write things down but I don't always get everything down that I should have down in preparation for a recording and then I find out that I missed something. So I'll just go through and do a little bit of a, a recap of some bits that I might have missed. They're not, not that uh, earth-shatteringly in interesting, but probably are worth making a note of anyway. Um, Love You Brisbane was first released in September of 1982, and then there were other versions in 83, um, 85, 86, and so on. Um, Simon Gallagher and I did a version together and I think that's on the internet and also Wickedy Whack um, a famous comedy band in Australia in Brisbane they did a version of it too so it was a very successful advertising campaign for Channel 7 um, that particular song enabled me to be able to do all sorts of um, cabaret shows. And at about that time, I don't think it was any earlier, but it might have been. It might have been a year earlier. It could have been in 1981. I can see my hair. It was long and blonde and straight with a fringe, so I think that's about 81. But I can't be absolutely certain. Every, every career has a darker side. Um, mine was no exception. And it was a darker side that I didn't wish to embark upon, but I sort of ended up um, roped into. Alan and I got a booking for a nightclub in Melbourne. And I think it was about seven or ten days, something like that. We, we were there for quite a while. And the the one who booked us was called Dwayne Zigliotto. That name is forever emblazoned into my brain. Because he refused to pay us. And that didn't go down very well, especially seeing as though we ended up in Melbourne at the Prince of Wales Hotel, a very sleazy kind of place. And you know me and my sleazometer. It went haywire. And this was the most haywire my sleazometer ever went. Because this was not your normal nightclub. I remember the afternoon we arrived. It was a cold, wet, sort of miserable kind of Melbourne day rather typical of Melbourne. I never liked Melbourne. Um, never liked Sydney much either, but I liked, probably liked Melbourne even, even less because it was unknown to me and also because it was a big city and I've never been a big city kind of person. Um, Melbourne, in those days, whenever I visited it or... Alan and I visited it. it, it had the capability of, you know, presenting like three, maybe four different seasons in one day. No, it never snowed, but it could be bitterly cold. And then an hour later, steaming, stinking hot. So, you know, we could go through, we, ha we didn't ever, never knew what to pack when we went to Melbourne. So we packed lots of cool stuff and lots of hot stuff, warm stuff, warm clothing. And uh, we generally needed it all. And we also needed an umbrella every time we went there because it would invariably rain. And I have a saying, up and down like a Melbourne thermometer. And it's a very accurate saying. So we went to Melbourne booked to do this particular nightclub stint and I remember we arrived at the uh, at the club after having checked into the motel the hotel nearby the Prince of Wales 
and out the front of the nightclub I saw these posters and there was a semi-naked girl um, her name was Hallie Wilde and there was another one called Susie these pictures scantily clad you know of, of these girls behind glass in a sort of like a um, an entrance porch sort of thing and I thought right I see what we're getting ourselves in for this looks like a strip joint so we went in and we checked out the place and organized rehearsals and so on uh, if memory serves me correctly, we had a band because we never had backing tracks in those days. They just didn't exist, so we we had a band. There was a band there. I don't remember if they were good, bad or indifferent. They were probably uh, adequate. They don't stand in my mind. I don't remember anything about the band. Um... But I do remember the surroundings. I remember the audience later that night. I remember the strippers. And there were two other girls, two decent young girls. They were sisters. Their names were, they were pretty blondes. They were, they were Cindy and Perry. Cindy and Perry Hamilton. And... Alan and I grew very close to those girls. They were very cute and sweet and funny and they were just our dear friends there. And we always said that if we, if we had a daughter, we'd name her Perry. That's where we got the idea of the name, for the name of Perry. But of course we never did have a daughter. Um, but we always loved the name Perry for a girl. So Perry and Cindy were, were terrific and uh, they were good friends of ours there. And I remember on the first night I arrived there and I thought, well, I'm going to go dressed. I didn't fancy getting changed in such a place, so I, I went dressed. Um, the outfit I had on was a little bit revealing. Well, a fair bit revealing, but nothing, <laughs> nothing like what these girls were wearing or not wearing. I was really respectably square compared to them. And I remember the first night I got on, we must have had some kind of band rehearsal, but I don't remember that. I remember the first time I got on there and, you know, we started with the opening number and as soon as I started there was a slight lull in the singing and some yobbo yelled out, Get it off! And I thought, I had a tough enough time getting this on, let alone getting it off. It was this of an outfit that buttoned up here and crossed over there and zipped up here, and it was very, very tricky. Yeah, I suppose it was a sexy outfit, but that's what you did in those days. I mean, if you were going to be an entertainer, you had to do, and you were a female, you had to try and be sexy. So it's just what I did. But I was always, I maintained that I was respectful respectable um so I thought okay this is what I'm in for eight or nine nights or whatever it was of this so I thought I'll just think of the money <laughs> in hindsight that's funny because we never got any money we performed night after night there and they were they were restless. They were they were just the, the audience were restless. They couldn't wait to get the strippers on. And Susie and Hallie would come on. Not long after we began this um, time in Melbourne, there we realised that not all was as it seemed. Hallie Wild was not exactly a girl. She started life as a boy and she had a, a sex change and I think it was a very good one from what I saw. Not that I went too, too deep in studying details but you know what I mean. It looked like it had been a very successful operation. 
And uh, Hallie was the, the real star attraction, stripper. Susie was a real girl, but Hallie was the, the star. And uh, it was quite an experience. It really was. I mean, all four, all four of the, the girls, uh, Cindy and Perry and Hallie and Susie and Alan and I, we would um, get together during the day and gather around the piano that was in the hotel and sing and talk and go out for lunch or go out for dinner and we hung about together. And it was all very good. We, we were good company for each other. And they were really quite decent people, comparatively speaking. Um, on one occasion, we all decided to do to go on a picnic at Hanging Rock, which wasn't too far away. And in Australia, there's a movie called Picnic at Hanging Rock, and it's rather spooky because uh, a few of the girls go missing and they were never found. It's a true story, apparently. Or it's based on a true story, the book and the movie were. So we went on our picnic at Hanging Rock, and that was an interesting day. Very, very interesting and funny. Um, Susie could be really, really funny. She had... Oh, there was another girl called Simone. She was another stripper. There were three strippers. Um... So, yeah, we had a pretty good day at Hanging Rock. It was interesting, good fun, lots of laughs. And it it soon became rather evident to me that Hallie, and this really confused me, it soon became evident that Hallie had a crush on me. Now, you think about it. This, this person was born a boy and had an operation to become a girl and was living as a girl. So I was very confused, as you can imagine. Very confused. So life was anything but dull during that time. And we used, like I said, we used to hang about in each other's rooms talking and laughing and um, telling stories and going out to dinner and all of that. And we all became very chummy and it was all, you know, decent. Nothing funny, nothing gross. I couldn't have handled it if it had been gross. Um, so we made the best of a bad situation. Because I did not want to be in a strip joint. But we found ourselves one night watching the show. <laughs> I could not believe it. I was in a strip joint watching the show. It was just, I mean, I look back on that and I, I just shake my head because that is not something I would have ever planned to do, but yet we did it. These had become our friends. And I had to, night after night, ignore the get it off, get it off. And after a while I started, you know, hurling insults or joking insults back at the audience. Um, so I'd say that was like about eight or nine days, something like that. And we then went back to Sydney and back to our normal life and kept in touch with Perry and Cindy because they were the they were the ones that we, we really liked. They were lovely girls, sweet girls and very funny, talented singing duo. Um, but it was really quite an experience. And when I got back, <laughs> I told my parents I'd been performing in a strip joint. And they were like, what? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so that was that was interesting, very interesting. I wouldn't do it again, not for anything, but uh, it was an experience. And then Alan had the very difficult task of trying to get Dwayne Zigliotto to pay up, and he didn't. Alan took him to court. Alan won. 
but that doesn't mean anything. You, you know, you might be able to win, but you can't force them to pay it. So that was very unfortunate. But I look, I look back, I'm glad of the experience. Um, it told me not to judge a person by their exterior or what they were lacking on their exterior. I found these, these girls all had really lovely hearts. Yes, so that was an interesting experience. And I think, I think the, the venue we were performing at was the Crazy Horse. I think we were at the Crazy Horse nightclub or strip joint. But I know there was a Crazy Horse there, whether the strippers worked at the Crazy Horse, which was in another venue, but I think we were at the Crazy Horse because I know that sticks in my mind. And it's really ironic because tonight I was watching this small short video about black-eyed children. I don't recommend you watch it. It's it's definitely demonic. Anyway, I just watched it because I wanted to know about it. And they featured um, an Indian resort or some place where Indians live. And on the sign it said Crazy Horse. And I thought, that's a bit weird. That's a bit weird. You know, Chief Crazy Horse? Anyway, that's just a, a strange aside. Not long after that, when we got back, and not because of it, but not long after that, um, I was doing the rounds of TV Week and People Magazine, Post Magazine, Pix Magazine, um, uh, newspaper articles and interviews and all sorts of things. I was waiting in some magazine office and a guy approached me and said... Um, because he knew who I was, he said, uh, you're Kim Durant, I would, I would like to offer you um, a Playboy spread. I went, what? He said, I'd like to offer you a Playboy spread. I said, um, no, thank you. He said, would you like to think about it? I said, I've thought about it. No, thank you. No, but really, would you, you know, just, just think about it. Here's my number. Give me a call. I thought about it. No, thank you. I suppose it was rather flattering in a way, but there was no way I was going to do that. So that was interesting. I mean, it's a very interesting profession, being an entertainer. But all these things come up that you just think would never happen. Very strange. Um, meant to say that <laughs> when we were in New Guinea about 79, at 4 o'clock every afternoon, soon it will be 4 o'clock, I don't know if I made that clear before, but the announcer was saying, soon it will be 4 o'clock, at 4 o'clock we will have the news, and then there was silence, they didn't say anything, nothing, and then he'd pipe up again, at 4 o'clock we will have the news. Soon it will be four o'clock. And there was another like 30 seconds of silence. This went on for about five minutes. And then it went, beep, it's four o'clock. I was like, everyone's going, you know, inside. Thank goodness for that. So I don't know if I explained that very clearly before. But anyway, at four o'clock, every afternoon, especially on Bougainville Island, it rained. So not only did we have a very strange venue to contend with, roof and a roof and no walls and just these posts holding up the roof. But we, and, and natives pushing against the, the uh, stage to get to me, the white woman, but we had like six inches of soft mud to wade through because every single afternoon on Bougainville Island, and I think back in Port Moresby, I can't be sure, but I don't see why not, but I know every single afternoon at four o'clock they got a heavy downpour of rain. So there was always mud. And that really sticks in my mind, this mud and these natives 
trying to press against the stage to get to this white woman. It was freaky. Especially seeing as though I was the white woman. Um, I might have to take a break now and try and get my thoughts in order. Because I've got my notes here. Try and find out what came next. I think what came next was Morning Melodies with Barry. I did hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of shows with Barry. Loved them. I loved doing shows with Barry. He was great. We always got along really well. Yeah, I think I think what came in about 83, 84 was the morning melodies, but I will just touch on something that I just remembered. In 83, I know this for sure, 1983, I was asked to travel to Adelaide. Alan came with me and I was invited to sing at the Adelaide uh, football grand final. I think it was Australian rules, football. I've never been a sports person. But um, I remember we had this outfit made, um, a short white skirt with a vest, a shiny blue and red and white vest with the, you know, made out of the Australian flag. It was a very nice outfit. And then the, the, other, dread, the other outfit that I wore for my main part, um, the first part of what I was doing there, um, I think it was at the beginning of the sporting event and then I did half time. So at the beginning of the sporting event, I, I think I did the Australian medley that I've done so many times. I think Jeff Wilkes did the arrangement for that and I wore um, a cocktail length white dress, white lacy dress and white lacy socks and, and uh, white shoes and I really liked that outfit. It was nice. And, um, yeah, I performed the, uh, the Australian medley. And I think I even might have performed... No, my song, Advance Australia, again, wasn't written then. I don't think. In your wildest dreams or nightmares, you couldn't even begin to imagine the fucking mess that Molly's made in the lounge room. I'm recording here. You couldn't What's she done? comprehend. She vomited. Oh no! Six liters <sighs> of vomit, and then shat next to the litter tray. She vomited six liters of vomit all over the living room. Thanks for sharing that with me. And I really have to cut this up now. Don't know how I'll do it, but I'll do it. Um, where was I? Oh, yes. 1983, the Adelaide Football Grand Final. I remember I walked out onto the field and I started singing and they all started yelling. They all started screaming. I thought, I'm a hit. I'm an absolute hit. They love me. And it wasn't until I got back to Brisbane later that day and saw the replay that I realised why they were screaming. There was a brawl on the field. Typical men. There was a brawl on the field, a great punch-up. And the cameras decided to leave me. This was my moment in the sun. I'm standing there singing whatever it was I was singing, I think it was the Aussie medley, and the cameras zoomed away from me and onto this brawl that began before the stupid sporting match ever, ever started. Most disappointed, most disappointed. My big moment and the cameraman left me they went off me. I mean, yeah, I was singing the national anthem now that I remember because Alan said it was just absolutely appalling that any television director would say, zoom away from the girl singing the national anthem. Hello, the national anthem, the, the musical symbol 
of national pride, zoom off her and go and watch these morons having a biff up on the other end of the field. No self-respecting patriot would ever suggest such a thing, but that's what they did. We were mortified and totally disgusted. And then it came uh, eventually half time. I had to go down, rush down actually, um, and get get changed into this outfit that had the Australian flag as one of the, as, as like a vest on top of this white skirt. Um, and somehow I had accidentally locked myself out of the dressing room. So I was running around trying to find somebody who could get me into the dressing room and I just made it by the skin of my teeth. And um, then I went out there. I think that's when I did the Aussie medley. I could be wrong. I think so. So that was quite an experience. All in all, it was very good. Um, how many, how many people, 60,000 people? can't remember how many. There, there were many thousands. And uh, it was a good experience until I got home and saw the replay. I realised that I've just got no respect. <laughs> stupid business this is. Music business is stupid. Stupid, stupid, stupid. And I was stupid for thinking it could ever be anything but stupid. Um, that was my little rant. And I'm glad I've had it. Now I'm going to have to edit this thing and try and cut out Alan's swear word and the recounting of our cat throwing up all over the uh, living room, which I really didn't need to know about right now. Okay. It's over and out. I might be able to put a loud beep over it or something. I don't know. I don't have the editing suite to do that. But I'll see what I can do. So this would be uh, segment 13. Yes. 13, the number for rebellion. <laughs> yeah, very disorderly number. Just like this has turned out. Very disorderly. It started out okay. So it's over and out from me on segment 13. I'll see what I can do to uh, sanitise this recording. Bye.